corn pesticides used to grow GMOs becoming less effective over time? What is the significance of this? Are we on the verge of creating weeds that are resistant to the herbicides, which will require us to use even more and stronger pesticides? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important to, um, I, I said this in my talk uh, yesterday, it's important to understand uh, very similar to what we're facing with antibiotics right now, with resistance to antibiotics. Uh, we have these bugs that have gotten their resistance. The same thing is happening in our agriculture. The idea that these weeds would not adapt is, again, bizarrely unscientific, even though Monsanto in the late 90s said that weeds would not develop resistance to Roundup. Uh, they said that in congressional testimony, and of course it was ridiculous. I found that uh, third grade science in Washington, D.C. teaches adaption. <laughs> So Monsanto wasn't even up to a third grade science level there. Um, and of course, we now have in well over half the farms in the United States, we have these super weeds that are resistant to Roundup. Uh, and something like, you know, pigweed, the, the, the consistency of baseball bats, and they grow so closely, you can't even knock them over with a combine. So we're not just at peak antibiotics, where we're really looking to the future saying we have to go to probiotics. We can no longer say the way to get rid of a, a bad bi bacteria is to kill all your bacteria. That was Neanderthal biology, Neanderthal biology. And uh, we now know probiotics, the real answer is to develop a really healthy bi bionomic biotic community in your body, and that's really going to be the answer. It's the same true with agriculture. We need to go to the probiotics of agriculture. We're at peak herbicides. Roundup was the only wide spectrum in those days thought to be relatively non-toxic herbicide we have. There are no new Roundups, none. There's none in the pipeline, zero. No one will tell you there is. Monsanto won't tell you there is. And so instead, now that Roundup is becoming useless in some areas because of these super weeds, they're going backwards. As I mentioned, they're going back to 2,4-D, which is an element of Agent Orange. They're going back to dicamba. They got rid of these older, more toxic herbicides because they thought Roundup was better. So we're at a chemical arms race going backwards to get rid of these super weeds. And of course, guess what? We already have a significant number of weeds that are tolerant, resistant to 2,4-D. We have a number of weeds that are resistant to dicamba. Eventually, just like the antibiotics problem, we w these weeds will be resistant to any chemical we can come up with. We thought that nature was no match for our chemical industry. Turns out our chemical industry is no match for nature. Nature bats last, and if you're a baseball fan, it bats a thousand. And so we're going to have to go to a completely new paradigm than this paradigm of extermination. It will not work with insects, it will not work with weeds, it will not work with fungi. This entire industrial model has been accelerated by the use of GMOs, which accelerates the use of these, but it was going to happen whether GMOs were there or not. That model of extermination, which happened, as McKay was saying, after World War II, that model is over, not because just of activists, it's because that's the way nature works. Adapt adaption will work, we will not be able to keep up with it, so we need agroecological methods that Shelley was talking about, we're going to, sooner or later, nature will win, and we better be there when it does, otherwise it's going to be for a very, very hard landing. And all the GMOs have done is massively accelerate the adaption of these weeds, and eventually of the insects, and eventually with our fungicides. We're also at peak fungicides, by the way, along with herbicides. Uh, so we're going to have to change our entire paradigm very soon to a whole new model of future of food and growing food. I'd like to uh, expand this conversation beyond just the production of food to uh, the evolution of advertising and marketing, which has made all of us into suckers. Uh, when you think about uh, the post-World War II advertising of lawn chemicals, so remember I mentioned the whole suburbanization of America, uh, that included not just houses but lawns, and now what we've got 50 million acres of lawns or something like that in the United States. And uh, what these chemical companies, not just, they were not just selling to food companies or, or agricultural companies, they were selling them to homeowners because now we had all these lawns and they needed to sell us herbicides. So what was the, the, the great villain of the American lawn uh, was clover. So clover happens to be a lovely little plant that is not hard on your feet. Uh, and they needed to convince American homeowners that clover was worth killing. So they came up with a really ingenious plan, and what they found, of course, is that clover is a uh, major food source for bees. And bees, uh, apparently, uh, are the great nemesis of all little kids playing soccer in their backyard. So you can go back and look at advertisements from the 1960s, and these chemical companies are saying, 
do your kids get stung by bees? Well, the reason they get stung by bees is because you have clover in your yard, and we have a product that will kill all the clover. And they would sell you these, these um, herbicides that would kill all the clover, which of course would then eliminate food sources for bees. The problem that they didn't think about, or maybe they did, it's hard to tell how diabolical they were, but clover, of course, is a nitrogen fixer. So once you kill all the clover in your yard, now your soil in your yard is now uh, nitrogen deficient. So the company say, is your lawn nitrogen deficient? Well, we can sell you nitrogen fertilizer. So now instead of selling you zero products, they're selling you two and killing all the bees to boot. So you have to take, this is where this environmental humanities component has to come in because you have to look at the way all this stuff is fed to us, not just the food, but the actual mythology that has grown up and has made us all kind of uh, robotic uh, you know, consumers of the products that they're trying to sell us. And you have to be unpack a lot of things to, to choose wisely. And just quickly, the language, and we mentioned this yesterday, the word pesticide should never be used because it, it, it leads you to immediately think that this, these chemicals know what a pest is and know what a pest isn't. That, that, that whether it be Roundup or whether it be the neonicotinoids, they don't know what a good what supposedly a good insect is or a bad insect is. So there's neonicotinoids that are supposed to deal with certain pests. They kill the bees. Well, are bees pests? No. They also kill birds, including quail in the area. Are they pests? No. They also kill caddisflies, which are a major source for fish in the rivers. Are they pests? No. We know that Roundup is a probable carcinogen, which means that it's probably causing cancer in children. Are children pests? No. Are grown-ups pests? Depending. <laughs> I work in Washington, D.C., so you can see where there's some issues right now for me on that one. But mostly no. And so therefore, they're not. And that Rachel Carson said this on the last page, and very important page of Silent Spring. Rachel Carson's one of my great heroes. If you've not read Rachel Carson, do so immediately. Silent Spring is a great place to start. And she said that we shouldn't call them pesticides. They are biocides. They kill living things. That is what they do. And to think that, again, that you can use these biocides in a way that doesn't kill so-called non-target organisms, that will not kill your butterflies and your bees and your birds and your kids, is ridiculous. That is what they do. And so let's stop using that mislabel. That's a very bad word, pesticides. They're biocides. So let's make sure we sort of get that into the language. Rachel Carson would be proud of us every time we use biocides instead of the wrong word, pesticides. And let me, I just want to, I'm oh, sorry, I, um, I just thought I'd build on this idea that uh, these gentlemen, McKay and Andrew, have been talking about this kind of change in paradigm. I mean, th this critique that um, <coughs> you're laying out, first of all, is important to really grasp because there, there needs to be kind of a change in orientation here. And secondly, to understand that um, this is not at the far edge of thinking. This kind of approach, a different way to approach agriculture, is firmly grounded in the sciences. And I, you know, I just spent, as you guys I'm sure have, several years kind of immersed in the new in the in the in the scientific journals about uh, new uh, ideas of agronomy and new ideas of of growing food, which is clearly showing that a diversity of food sources, more organically rich material, is far more resilient to uh, uh, dramatic shifts in conditions and that the industrial food system depletes the soil. Now, the, uh, what's interesting is that the, some of the biggest institutions in the world have actually come to this very same conclusion. So just bring us back a little bit um, uh, um, to uh, 2008, which I know seems like ancient, you know, a whole other uh, epic uh, from us. But basically, even before, let's say three years before 2008, which would have been 2005, there was a very heavy pressure campaign being put on the World Bank, which you're probably familiar as one of the big, huge financial institutions that has a huge influence on agricultural development strategies in developing countries. And um, the pressure was on asking the World Bank to really have a look at the effectiveness of the kind of industrial ag strategy that they'd been promoting. And it was led by some uh, NGOs around, Food First is one of them, uh, Friends of the Earth that some of you might be familiar with, uh, various, a couple of these international NGOs. So finally, the World Bank, to get them off their back, just to say, like, leave us alone, cool it, we'll, we'll commission a study. 
So the World Bank, the major mainstream huge uh, institution, rounded up several dozens of millions of dollars, hired an incredible team of uh, scientists led by a scientist who was working in Kenya at the time, and he's, he's an entomologist, uh, um, and at one of the top kind of insti scientific institutions in the world. He hired a team of about 400 people in different parts of the world to actually analyze what impact industrial agriculture was having, and did it work? Were the new technologies improving uh, yields? Were they improving access to food, which was one of the questions earlier about yields? And um, I'm compressing a, a, a long and uh, story about this. In 2008, the um, the, um, the, 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 the committee uh, came out with this report, and the report was actually a scathing critique of the industrial agriculture system that the World Bank itself was funding, and um, which completely astonished the World Bank. It was the last thing they expected. It was actually an independent science study. The scientist himself, an independent uh, person. I've talked to several numerous people involved in, 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 the, in the study. They're all deeply grounded in the scientific traditions. And um, the uh, World Bank was astonished that this critique essentially said a number of things. Number one, that the export of these kind of modern agricultural technologies, including NGO, uh, GMOs, was not increasing the yields of um, food. Number two, that actually the requirement for inputs to buying chemicals and other uh, products were actually putting uh, farmers into debt and actually creating, worsening the conditions on farms. Uh, and three, that the kind of trade deals that were being cut to actually turn countries into commodity producers was actually undermining farmers' status on their land. So three very important um, uh, critiques deeply grounded. This hit like a <laughs> stone wall in the Bush administration. George Bush was president at that time. It was the last year of George Bush's administration, George W. Bush. Um, the, it was the last thing the Bush administration <laughs> wanted to hear. Um, the United States basically issued an official dissent to it, essentially saying that, 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 the, that the scientists neglected to include um, some of the, uh, the possible benefits of GMOs and basically lobbied the world to withdraw its support for this study, which is what happened. So basically in 2008, as the world economy was going through its troubles, remember there was that back in 2008, this report was essentially withdrawn from uh, public discussions, why you haven't heard of it before, and it's why, um, and, uh, and yet this report was identifying many of the exact same things that we're talking about here at this table about the kind of flaws and vulnerabilities of industrial agriculture affirmed by some of the top scientific and minds when it comes to the agricultural sciences in the world. And so that report now informs a lot of people who are advocating reform of this system, but I just want to point out that the discussion we're having here is not drawn from the kind of, not that it ever would have been, <laughs> all these people's work I, I, I res have respected over the years, so this is not, I, I'm just saying any perception that this is somehow out of the mainstream of established scientific thinking and international institutions who are doing honest analysis of how this works is completely consistent. 